Very interesting attitude. Myself <laughs> is an interesting one. Uh, so thank you. First of all, thank you very much, everybody, for um, participating today. Uh, my name is Janet Rodriguez. I'm a member of the International Socialist. And uh, I would like to welcome you all to this next meeting of uh, this session of uh, Marxism 2016. Uh, the title is, Why is there endless war? And I will have the pleasure of sharing this meeting. Um, our speaker today is Sid Lacombe. Uh, he's an anti-war activist and he'll be speaking for about 30 minutes. After that, we will have lots of time for discussion, so feel free to jot down your questions. Uh, the session will be finished at 4, we're going to try to you know, keep uh, um, uh, If you have any um, uh, questions, you know, we will have definitely a time for discussion. That's good? Okay. okay. I take it away. Cool. All right. Um, why is there endless war? Is the title of this uh, discussion, and looking at the world around us right now, you can uh, you can understand why it is that people sort of think that war is is an absolutely never-ending uh, phenomenon. That it's uh, something that has been endemic uh, for human society for for, for a long time. Um, we're looking, for example, at the, the long war, the seemingly incessant war uh, that has been going on in the Middle East uh, over the course of the last you know, 20 to 30 years specifically with the United States and its, uh, its, its attempts to invade and dominate uh, um, countries throughout that particular region. We're in a situation right now, of course, where we're looking at the, the campaigns that are being launched by the Western powers against ISIS, as, as an example, and we're being constantly told that this is going to be an incredibly long conflict, um, despite the fact that, again, we've already seen years and years and years and indeed decades of conflict that have been initiated predominantly by, by the Western imperialism throughout the region. Um, if you look at the, what the pundits are saying here in this country and in various different spots in the West, they're talking about this campaign to be able to defeat ISIS being a war that could last generations, potentially, to be able to get rid of the, the, the scourge that is ISIS in, in, in the Middle East, um, without, of course, ever recognizing the fact that much of this has actually arisen because of the interventions of the Western powers in the first place. And so at each point in the process, as we see more military interventions and more military incursions into the Middle East, we're going to see a perpetuation of this war. We're not actually going to see an end to it. Um, and this, of course, is all happening in a context, uh, sort of post-Cold War, post the 20th century, which was by far the bloodiest century that we have ever seen in human history. Uh, if you look at the combination, even just the, the, the two major wars, World War I and World War II, somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 million people were killed between those two uh, wars themselves. And so you can understand, obviously, the notion that, that war seems to be something that is a constant. It, we're seeing it now as an industrial level slaughter as well, again, as we saw throughout, throughout the, the world wars. And the, the types of weaponry that are available all the way up to, obviously, the weapons of mass destruction, in particular nuclear weapons, uh, give people a sense that, that this is something that is going to be damn near impossible or you know, perhaps not possible at all to be able to stop. But I want to actually be able to open this up with a little bit of a different uh, look at this, because this is actually not the case, uh, it is not the case throughout human history that it has always been this way. In fact, it's it, war as we see it, which is mass organized killing of other, you know, generally poor people killing other poor people for the benefit of rich people, has something that actually is, is very, very specific to the nature of, uh, uh, to the development of class society. There's been variations on what that actually looks like over the course of, of, of the millennia, um, but this is something that uh, we are. There is indeed an ongoing debate about this, uh, specifically with people who are looking at the archaeology and looking at the historical records about whether or not war is something that is inherent to human beings or whether or not it's something that is, is in fact a, a product of, of the development of class society. And when we look at uh, some of the, the historical examples and looking way, way back, we see something very, very different. We see extended periods of time where since the point when he most, or sorry, Homo sapiens sapiens actually got up on to, uh, and, and started spreading out throughout the world, that there was incredibly lengthy periods of time where there was not organized warfare. Um, indeed, there's a, the guy who was speaking earlier today, um, Rani from, from Turkey, I was, had 
privilege of being in a talk that he did last year at a conference in London, where he was looking at the historical record, particularly in Turkey, and we're talking about early Neolithic civilizations back to 9000 BC, um, and looking at the sort of history and the layers of history that sort of came up in relation to those. And one of the things that was incredibly striking is there are periods for what seem to be, being based on the archaeology, thousands of years, where there is no evidence of widespread war. There is no evidence of widespread slaughter. What they do begin to see is that the archaeology changes at various different points along the way, whereby you've got a period where everybody seems to be living in a, in a home that seems to be the same size, then there's a layer on top where all of a sudden there's a large number of small homes and a very small number of very large homes, most of which have um, one thing that is very noticeable, which is caches of weaponry that are actually existing in, in those particular areas. And we're talking about literally thousands of years where there was not that type of warfare, not that type of, of, of organized um, um, killing. <coughs> People have killed each other in various other ways, but ultimately the, the specific variation that we see that is, is war, which is the organized slaughter, is something that is actually newer than we might think. Now for us here, the main thing that we're going to have to look at if we're looking at why it is that we're in a situation right now where it seems as though there is endless war is we need to actually take a look at what the, the sort of structure of, of imperialism in particular looks like um, and what it has looked like over the course of the last uh, uh, number of centuries. If we want to take a look, I mean, there's been empires of various types over the millennia. Uh, we, we all know about them, Rome, Persia, uh, the Mongol Empire, uh, each of which has been characterized by the need to control ever larger areas of the world, which is something that's relatively consistent. Each successive empire learned from its predecessors and in some way has expanded the territory at the expense of its neighbors. These were not, however, all the same. Specific moments of historical development um, have created empires that have very, very different sort of characteristics, despite the fact that there are some basic contours, in particular the fact that the need to be able to control resources. And, oh man, it keeps skipping to the next page when I don't want it to yet. All right, um, <laughs> what we're looking at now, though, in particular, is a specific variation of imperialism under capitalism the empire uh, or imperialism as we see it today in, in its most modern form. The sort of earliest examples that we see of this and where it actually sort of stems from were the initial colonial uh, expansions, in particular started by Spain, Portugal, the, the um, move to take over and to consolidate control of the Americas, which of course turned into the scramble by the various European powers, Britain, France, uh, uh, Spain, Portugal again, to be able to actually control, control the Americas. And we also see this expansion over the course of a period of a number of centuries, expanding to other parts of the world. <coughs> and ultimately, where we see the development of modern capitalism within the European context, spreading its tentacles in various different ways, shapes, and forms to be able to create what we see now, which is in fact a truly global system of domination by uh, stronger states over weaker states. And this was a deliberate process. It was not something that sort of, sort of happened by accident. Whenever you read the uh, the sort of imperial apologists that come out, in particular from Britain, just because I, I read those ones from time to time. It always seems as though the, the takeover of India and the takeover of China as examples were largely accidental. They just, they had to go in, they had to protect their own interests, they really didn't have a choice. And But when you dig into it a little bit further, you realize that this was a game very, very uh, 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 deliberate and it was a process that was done for the specific reason of being able to gain control of uh, resources, cheap labor, and to be able to actually gain further sort of uh, control over, over uh, uh, the development of, of economic sort of prosperity. There's a, it's one of the books that we're going to be talking about here, there's a fantastic little chart in here which takes a look at the relative shares of, of uh, manufacturing output. I just want to read a few stats out of this. The relative shares of manufacturing output between various different countries over the span of about 150 years, starting off in 1750. And then I wanted to sort of point this out because it's, it shows you exactly how the imbalance was shifted based on the way imperialism operated. And so, for example, in 1750, the total share of manufacturing output for Britain was about 1.9% of the global share. At the same time, China's uh, share of uh, global output was 32.8%, and India's share was 24.5%. Skip ahead 150 years from the point at which the uh, uh, British went in and literally 
through the barrel of a gun, took control of these countries and forced open their, their markets to be able to actually allow for those uh, British exports and for the importation of uh, uh, cheap materials. At that point, Britain is, we're looking at 1900, is responsible for roughly 18.5% of international trade, whereas China has dropped to 6.2 and India has dropped to 1.7, right? This was deliberate underdevelopment. These countries were, were attacked. And if you look at the situation, for example, around China, it's one of the striking ones. There was a moment when the European powers, desperate to open up the Chinese markets and desperate to open up trade into that particular part of the world, they found themselves in a little bit of a conundrum. The conundrum was the fact that there wasn't really anything that was being built in Europe that the Chinese wanted in any quantity. So they had to manufacture, on some level, uh, something that would actually be forced uh, as, a, as a, a product that the Chinese would need. In the case of China, uh, in, with Britain and China in that particular situation, what we resulted, what the result was, was the production of massive amounts of opium, of course, in India, that was then forced into the Chinese market, which then, of course, created the, the conflict. And the British went to war, of course, during the opium wars, as they're called, to be able to make sure that these these countries had opened up their markets to to the Brits. They were not, of course, the only country that was was doing so. Each one of them was in competition with each other. Uh, to be able to actually gain this kind of an advantage internationally. In the 19th century, what we saw was a real acceleration in, in this process. And ultimately, it was a violent breakdown of advanced but often pre-capitalist societies by the major capitalist powers. Um, it was an accumulation by dispossession and slavery, the plunder of resources to allow capital accumulation and expansion. It was different than in previous epochs in the sense that the accumulation of capital had become the driving force itself, and its needs were never ending. <clears throat> Marx actually used to talk about the difference between the accumulation by ruling classes in, in other eras compared to capitalism. He, you know, under feudalism, for example, the required surplus was only the surplus that was required to fill the belly of the lord, whereas under capitalism it was required to actually accumulate for its own sake to be able to actually maintain your position of, of dominance. Uh, that desire to, to accumulate is a pretty much is a key aspect of how capitalism works, and it's a central dynamic of the system that has to forever be fed. If not, uh, states and the capital that they represent internationally will fall behind. Capitalism, capitalist imperialism, therefore, constitutes the intersection of two forms of competition: the economic and the geopolitical. So what we're seeing here is the need to be able to gain control of markets, resources, cheap labor, and to do so at the expense of, of your rivals. It's incredibly important, and for any country to stand up and essentially say, we're not going to play that game anymore, means they will be falling, falling behind. And it means ultimately that domestic corporations will, will end up paying the price um, in, in a number of different ways. During the uh, 1970s, the economic slump the, of the 1870s and the 1880s, the first great sort of depression, as it's generally called. These uh, European states all needed to find both new markets and sources of natural resources to be able to prop up sagging economies. This is another element of what happens with, with imperialism, is it's a way to be able to artificially inflate um, um, economic development, uh, or at least the economic numbers at home. One of the ways that, that, that they did that, of course, was investing uh, abroad. Uh, <coughs> to gain returns in buying foreign stock and developing projects in various different parts of, of, of the world, which then, of course, provided a justification in the event that those uh, investments were seen to be under threat. It cre created a justification for the military intervention to be able to actually move in, to be able to, to uh, take over. And we see example after example of this. I mean, the British ended up ultimately taking over Egypt based on really falsified documents suggesting that, that British interests within Egypt were actually being lost and, and therefore they need to be able to move in and take over. Um, what they did when they did take over was again the process of, of, of deliberate underdevelopment. What their concern was at that particular point was, was more the fact that the, there was the development of, of industrialization within Egypt. Um, that is in particular around the creation of textiles. 
And so the cotton that was being grown there was being refined into textiles within the Egyptian state. For the British who wanted to make sure that all of that cotton was brought um, in raw form to Britain, to the Lancashire mills to be able to actually be formed into cloth, they needed to do something about that. And what they did was they invaded, they took over the equipment, they either blew it up or they sent it back to their own country to make sure that they could actually turn and make sure that Egypt, for example, would stay essentially as a giant plantation. We saw the process then again accelerating over the, that, that period of time. Uh, one stat that actually shows sort of how quickly the, the later stages of, of that particular colonization existed uh, comes up here. In 1876, less than 10%, this is the scramble for Africa. Africa is sort of a later uh, um, addition to the, the imperial framework in that sense. In 1876, less than 10% of Africa was actually colonized. By 1900, so less than 25 years later, 90% of the continent was colonized. The major powers, US, UK, France, and Belgium, were all in control of vast swaths of the world. And by 1900, there were only four actually independent states uh, that existed without having some sort of foreign domination. Uh, remnants of the Ottoman Empire, Thailand, Ethiopia, and Afghanistan were the, were the countries at that point. There was a problem, though, of course, because the development that was happening in Europe at the same time was not sort of being reflected exactly in the, the way that the tentacles of, of imperialism were moving forward. And the biggest sort of loser in this process was Germany. Um, Germany being one of the most quickly expanding of the European powers, but they had really lost out and, and were much further behind many of the other uh, countries in relation to, to being able to actually take over various different lands throughout the world. And whenever they tried to, they cut butting into the conflicts with other uh, major major powers. You look at the Berlin to Baghdad Railway, they were trying to bring it down through the Balkans, and as people know, each of the European powers had various different client groupings within the Balkans that they were trying to support, and that actually continued, of course, right up until, and is continuing to this day. And what it meant, of course, was that Berlin was, was constantly running into these other powers and not able to expand in the way that uh, it, it wanted to. And so it decided under those circumstances, I mean, along with many of the others, there became an arms race to be able to build up um, uh, the military to support domestic capital. And that's when we started to see the major flashpoints between the imperial powers on the imperial continent, or on, on the European continent in relation to this. And it was in this context that the clas classical sort of notions of imperialism um, um, were outlined, uh, you know, with Bukhar and Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg, they began developing this as they were watching inter-imperial rivalry existing in, in World War I, and as we know, that sort of led to World War II in, in a number of ways, and uh, resulted again in the killing of tens of millions of people. Oh man, it's done. Okay, post-war, the U.S. of course came out on top. The U.S. was in a situation whereby it was able to use, in particular, World War II as an opportunity to be able to actually uh, increase their own uh, domestic production. Um, they became the, the, the factory uh, of, of the war effort um, that was going on in Europe. And so by the end of the First or the Second World War, not only had they managed to expand or, uh, industrially far beyond anything that any of the other powers could, uh, they also had massive debts, the Europeans had massive debts to the Americans as a result of the, the, the war itself because they were able to, to sell them uh, the weaponry that was required. And so the U.S. actually ended up becoming, again, the dominant, dominant global power. And it could control economies in a number of different ways. Um, it wasn't simply a question of the military uh, control, but it was also through things like the Bretton Woods Agreements, the IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, which is what came out of that, and through the political institutions such as the United Nations uh, and military alliances such as NATO, which gave the U.S. that, that dominant position. Uh. And I mean, what it turned into under those circumstances, it became a complete system that was dominated uh, completely by the US and shut out all potential rivals uh, for control of certain areas of resources throughout uh, the planet. Now, that sort of comes up in relation to some of the, the, the contemporary theories that we hear about uh, imperialism. And there's a number of different variations that come up that we should probably take a quick look at because they do speak to some of the debates and some of the conflicts that we're having now about trying to understand exactly what's happening in, in the world. A little bit louder? Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> All right, so I mean, and there's a number of different variations again that, that, that are outlined in this book. Um, one of the ones that became quite fashionable coming out of the, the postmodernist uh, sort of uh, academic uh, uh, discourse of the discourse out of the uh, 90s and into the early 2000s, uh, put forward by, by Hart and Negri in particular, is that globalization and transnational capital has spread its 